All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to present to you some uh, recent work about um, a newly discovered uh, instability affecting neutral star binaries, uh, whereby uh, gravitational waves emitted by a tidally deformed star in the binary uh, increases the energy of the tidal deformation and on a secular time scale. And uh, this also has some interesting implications for uh, the neutral star binary evolution. Okay, so let me just go straight to the point. Uh, assume that you have a star which is rotating with an angular velocity, uh, denoted by capital omega here, uh, which is perturbed by uh, some tidal potential due to its companion. And uh, what we can do, if you are familiar with Newtonian hydrodynamics, uh, you will recognize this as the Euler equation. So this is basically the equation of motion of the perturbation, or in this case, the tidal perturbation, which is denoted by C. Here is the Coriolis force, and the rest of the symbols have their usual meanings, pressure, density, gravitational potential. And on the right, we have the force, which in this case is the tide, uh, which drives this perturbation. And uh, we can also calculate the energy rate for our perturbation, uh, which is given by this inner product here. And what we expect in the case of the energy of the tide is uh, for the energy to grow. Uh, because for a binary in a circular orbit, uh, due to gravitational wave emission from the orbital motion of the two bodies, the orbit is shrinking. This is called in spiral. And um, because the objects come, come closer together, the tide on the objects is growing. Uh, so now we ask um, what happens uh, when we take into account gravitational wave emission from the tidally perturbed star itself. Uh, so the idea here is that um, uh, when you have a tidally perturbed star, the tide moves around as the binary system uh, orbits. And uh, this causes a, a, a quadruple deformation on the star. So as the, tide, as the tidal deformation is moving around, it should it's by itself emit gravitational waves or contribute to the gravitational wave signal uh, that we see from from the uh, orbiting binary. And uh, in order to take this into account in Newtonian gravity, we have to uh, put an extra term here by hand, uh, which is uh, the potential accounting for gravitational waves in this case. And it is, uh, as you might expect, it is uh, proportional to some derivative of, uh, of the mass multiples uh, of the star here, depending on which multiple you use, uh, this changes. And uh, now, based on this, we can calculate uh, the contribution of gravitational wave emission to the energy rate of the tide. And uh, by doing this, we find that, in general, uh, this should be negative, uh, which you might expect, because uh, the emission of gravitational waves from a system uh, generally dumps the system. It, uh, uh, reduces its energy. Uh, but in this case, if this factor here is also negative, then uh, the contribution of gravitational waves to the energy rate of the tidal perturbation becomes positive. So basically, this means that the emission of gravitational waves uh, from a tidally perturbed um, object uh, is uh, uh, is making is causing the energy of the tide to grow. So it causes uh, an instability, uh, and it occurs when the angular velocity of the star is larger than uh, the, uh, the orbital frequency of the system. What I wanted to show you in these videos uh, is, uh, it's just a simple illustration really, so it might not even be so important. Uh, so the point is that um, uh, during, uh, during this instability, uh, when you look at the star from a distance from an inertial frame, you will see that the tide is always prograde in this frame. So it, uh, the tide moves at the same direction as the, uh, as the rotation of the star. Uh, however, when this instability criterion is active, uh, if you sit on the rotating frame, because your star is rotating faster than the tide, you will see the tide going backwards. So you will see the, the tide as retrograde in this rotating frame. Um, 
So uh, this can uh, give you some insight on how this instability actually works. Um, so uh, an, an intuitive way of picturing this is that gravitational waves uh, uh, deduct uh, angular momentum from uh, the tidally perturbed star as it moves around. But because the tide is moving more slowly than the background star, it has actually a negative angular momentum. So the gravitational waves end up making the angular momentum of the tidal perturbation even more negative, And this leads to an instability. And uh, the mechanism is actually very similar and reminiscent of the classic Chandra Sekhar Friedman shoots uh, instability, which is known for, for decades now. Uh, but uh, the difference is that the CFS instability applies to normal modes, so to free oscillations on the star, which are dragged forwards by uh, fast rotation, whereas here we have a forced oscillation, which is in this case a tide. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we can assess the significance of this instability by putting some numbers in and calculating uh, a characteristic growth time for instability uh, using this uh, uh, simple known uh, formula above. Uh, for simplicity, we assume that the angular velocity of the star and the orbital angular momentum are collinear. Uh, uh, and uh, we consider the quadruple components of the tide, uh, which are, uh, well, they are the most important anyway uh, in almost every context. Uh, and uh, we model the neutron star as a um, uh, polytropic star. So we use a polytropic equation of state. Uh, this particular one has uh, an index uh, n equals one. So this is um, both, let's say, an appropriate equation of state for neutron stars, uh, but also it, um, uh, it has analytic solutions. Uh, so it makes uh, some, I mean, this is, this calculation is just to show how this instability works. So uh, it, it is nice to have some analytic relations anyway. Um, and uh, we just get some typical values for the mass and the radius of the neutron star. And from this, we can uh, calculate the time scale, which is uh, given by this long line. I, I, I use the pointer on my screen, but obviously you cannot see it. So uh, when, uh, when we plot this, actually, uh, I, sorry, let me just say the, the instability growth time uh, depends on orbital parameters like d, which is the orbital distance, uh, m prime, which is the, um, the mass of the companion. And this f function is just the instability criterion written in a slightly different way uh, as a function of the orbital parameters. Uh, so when we plot this uh, instability growth time on the uh, lower right, uh, for various values of the orbital distance d and the angular velocity of the star, uh, we see that actually it should be active in a very, very large part of the parameter space. So, so it's almost an intrinsic instability. It so, seems to be always there. Uh, uh, however, uh, the timescales associated uh, with it are quite long. Uh, so the lighter the color, the longer the time. Uh, as you go closer to the merger of the two objects, the, the growth time can get quite short of order seconds. Uh, however, if we go to the next overlay, uh, uh, we have to uh, to compare this time scale with the spiral time scale, which is uh, the uh, the evolution time scale of the system. Uh, and uh, what we find by calculating also the spiral time scale shown in this small uh, vertical box next to the uh, to the big plot, uh, we see that the spiral time scale is always shorter than this instability time scale, uh, which basically means that the instability doesn't have enough time to develop because uh, the orbit shrinks too fast for, uh, for this instability to, uh, to cause any, uh, any big effects uh, on, the, on the tide on the neutron star. Uh, and uh, the mass ratio doesn't seem to affect the result. Uh, this is for typical Neutron star binary mass ratios. Um, I, 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 I also tried some uh, cases where the neutron star has a much larger companion. And in this case, the situation gets much, much better in terms of uh, growth uh, time scales. But uh, this is uh, ongoing work. So uh, just wanted to mention that. Uh, if we go to the next slide. 
now, the idea is that even though uh, this instability seems to be, uh, doesn't seem to have enough time to, uh, to develop, uh, its effects could still accumulate through the in-spiral because during the in-spiral you have many, many cycles um, and uh, until the two objects merge, uh, the effects from this instability could accumulate and then in the end you maybe you could see something in the gravitational wave signal. And this is actually also what happens with regular tides. Uh, uh, the, the effects of actual tides in the gravitational wave signal are not that big, but because they accumulate through the spiral, we can in the end see a phase error in the gravitational wave signal, which is measurable and, uh, and we can measure its effects this way. Uh, so what we do uh, here, just uh, the technical details are not important, just to outline the, uh, the basic idea, we just uh, consider some uh, simple energy and angular momentum conservation arguments. Uh, we calculate the correction to the gravitational wave uh, emission uh, uh, due to the tide. So this epsilon parameter there is accounts for these corrections. The zeroth order term is simply the point mass limit. So if you model the two stars as point masses, uh, this is the gravitational wave emission you get. And uh, this epsilon parameter, which accounts for these tidal corrections, involves, as you might expect, the tidal love number, which if you heard the previous talk by George or the morning talk by Costas, uh, it, it just, uh, it's a parameter that uh, tells you how much your star can be actually deformed when you put it inside the tidal field of a companion. And this, it depends on the equation of state, but anyway, the details are not important for, for our case. Uh, and then what you do is uh, you separate the orders, uh, for example, in the energy of the, of the tide that we also calculated before, you separate the various orders, with, you, cal you calculate uh, the corresponding corrections to first and second order in this parameter epsilon. And what you end up with at the bottom is a formula for the orbital separation which now is corrected due to tidal effects. And again, the zeroth order term, the first term is the point mass limit. Uh, and you have uh, corrections of order epsilon, which are due to simply due to the fact that your objects are not point masses anymore, they have a finite size. So just from this, uh, just from this you get a correction in the, um, in the in spiral rate. And then the, and, and, and these corrections actually accelerate the in spiral. So, uh, uh, they, uh, the, 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 the two stars as they orbit each other, uh, the, the, the evolution is actually faster uh, due to the fact that they have a finite size. And uh, the epsilon square corrections, the second order corrections, are from this instability that we just discussed. And uh, if you see the minus sign, they actually decelerate the in spiral. So uh, the evolution becomes slower due to this, uh, due to these corrections. And uh, if we quantify them, if we go to the next slide, um, we can calculate the number of orbital cycles. Uh, okay, due to the, uh, the zeroth order term again is the point mass case, first order correction, second order corrections. Uh, the first order corrections you can see on the lower left uh, and the second order corrections due to this instability on the lower right. So the first order corrections are negative. So we have, fewer cycles in this case because the uh, evolution uh, is faster and the, for the second order corrections due to this instability we have uh, more cycles because uh, the uh, the in spiral is decelerated and uh, you will notice that there is an order of magnitude difference between the two uh, so uh, this means that if we can if we current detectors we can uh, get an estimation of tidal effects, so for, for the first order corrections in this case, uh, we, uh, we um, with, with next generation gravitational wave detectors, where the order of magnitude, uh, where the, sorry, where the sensitivity will be an order of magnitude better, uh, these, uh, these, type of, these type of corrections uh, might become significant for them. Uh, and I should also point out that there is also um, uh, an influence on the spin, on the background spin of the star, which is shown on the upper right, uh, which is again, it seems to be negligible, but uh, in any case, this is just a simple model to illustrate the instability. So um, there, there might be cases where this, this effect is bigger. 
And uh, if we go to the last slide, um, just a quick summary. Uh, so um, what we said is that um, uh, the tidal perturbation in rotating stars should be unstable to gravitational wave emission if the star is rotating faster than the companion orbits the star. Uh, this happens because uh, the tide is prograde in the inertial frame, but appears retrograde in the rotating frame. And this, uh, similar to a mechanism of the, similar to the mechanism of the classic CFS instability, um, uh, makes the energy of the tide grow on, on secular time scales. Uh, it is active on a very large part of the parameter space. Uh, as I said, the instability is almost intrinsic; it's almost always there, but. Uh, when we calculate the relevant time scales, we see that it is actually quite slower than the in spiral. So the instability doesn't have much time to, to develop. However, its effects are accumulated through the in spiral. And what we find is that it slows down the in spiral or it should slow, slow down the in spiral and decreases the stellar spin. And uh, as I said, all this uh, could be relevant for next generation detectors because uh, Actually, what people do nowadays uh, from uh, current uh, neutron star binary observations with gravitational waves is they try to uh, put constraints on the neutron star equation of state. Uh, Costas uh, gave an extensive overview talk this morning. Um, and uh, for this reason, uh, these kind of effects, uh, all, all kinds of tidal contributions and other contributions potentially uh, should all be uh, correctly identified so that we know uh, when we actually measure the tidal deformability from a gravitational wave signal so that we know uh, exactly what we measure and uh, uh, what what effect comes from what phenomenon. Um, so yeah, I think that's it.